Did you know we built planets? Oh, yes. Fascinating trade. Worlds. World building helps to pull us into certain kinds of video games, films, and stories of all kinds. It allows us to immerse ourselves in their rich environments, their atmospheres and scenes. It also allows franchises to build around common universes with central and peripheral characters, all living within the same set of physics, geography, politics, and other rules of an imagined reality. As a concept, world building pulls film, art, literature, and architecture together under a shared purpose. And in this video, we will look at world building from the perspective of architecture, comics, and their overlap to learn how they work and to dive into some of the most successful examples. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Stuart Hicks, and I teach architecture design studios and lecture courses at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I just came from an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago. And it's called Chicago Comics, and it's curated around a couple questions. And one of those questions is, what tools do comic artists use to build rich worlds and characters? That question got me thinking about building rich worlds. How do comic artists do it? And how is it different from architects? The exhibition is a perfect case study because there are worlds constructed inside of each one of those comics, and each one of those are all housed within a single physical exhibition. And so I wanted to dive a little deeper into how these two activities, comics and architecture, and how they approach world building together. So in the rest of this video, we'll go through together and we'll talk a little bit about what world building is in general. We'll take a brief tour of how it's been considered in architecture and with architects who makes comics as part of their process. And then we'll talk about that exhibition on Chicago comics. I was even able to sit down with the exhibition's designer to discuss his thoughts about world building and how those thoughts figured into the show. So let's get to it. The term world building begins in the 1800s, and it has a long history inside of the literary world, especially in science fiction. World building is defined as the process of constructing an imaginary world or fictional universe. This includes developing an imaginary setting with coherent qualities such as history, geography, and ecology. World building often involves the creation of maps, uh, a kind of backstory, and then with races of inhabitants, etc. And popular filmic examples include Marvel or Star Wars or Star Trek. The term world building became popular in mainstream culture as a concept in the 1960s, with figures like J.R. Tolkien and Star Wars creating epic multi-part stories all set within the same universe. Of course, architecture is a discipline concerned with building our world and the world of buildings. But what is its role in this other way of considering the term world building? And how do all these things relate? One of my favorite crossovers comes when painters fix their brushes on buildings. And this happens a lot in the practice of capriccio paintings. Capriccio in Italian means architectural fantasy, placing together buildings, archaeological ruins, and other architectural elements in fictional and in sometimes fantastical combinations. The style of painting was introduced in the Renaissance and continued well into the Baroque. These kinds of paintings often use perspectival or pictorial representations of space to depict worlds which aren't necessarily impossible, but just don't exist in real life. Like with collections of depictions of real buildings placed next to one another, which in real life are very far apart in time and in space. Also, Capriccio might use paintings of paintings to create layers of nested realities, one inside of the other. One of my favorites of this style is the painter Joseph Michael Gandy. He was an architectural illustrator, and he famously depicted the work of the architect John Soane in London. And he would paint Soane's designs as, as if they were ruins even before they were built. Or in the, the painting, the various designs for the public and private buildings, he shows all of Soane's designs all together in a single room as huge models. Fast forwarding to the early 1900s, and world building and architecture focused its sight on utopias. The interest in architecture and the arts shifted from the imagined realities for the sake of it, like in Capriccio, in service of imagining perfect worlds that try to solve all of life's messiness all through good design. Some of the most common examples of these might be like Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, a model of suburbia with buildings spaced really far apart, zoned by similar uses, and connected with a well-planned, gridded network of roads and flying transport. Or another might be Le Corbusier's Plan Wazon, a plan of skyscrapers separated by large green parks. Or another might be Ludwig Hilbersheimer's decentralized, multi-layered city of skyscrapers and expressways going everywhere. Of course, I hope that we've learned some lessons from this kind of thinking, that often what are intended as paths towards utopia rarely result in the kind of perfection that guides them. 
In reaction to these, after World War II, came a new crop of architects that were again interested in an unfettered experimentation in world making. And they looked to comics for how to do this. And the medium of comics allowed them to create alternative worlds with unique sensibilities as a way of testing new architectural opportunities for the buildings that live inside of them. And good examples of this might be practices like Super Studio, who made multi-panel narratives of cautionary tales about faith in geometry. And they created hauntingly beautiful drawings of modern geometry taking over the entire world. The comic allowed geometry to gain a kind of motivation, creating parallels with figures like Hilbersheimer. But rather than thinking this design would save the world, they were showing how easily we've been seduced. And they create a continuous monument, a beautiful, universal architecture that could house the entire world. They even made furniture that you could buy that almost feels like it fell out of one of these alternative realities, and you too can own a piece of it. Then we have people like Arkazoom, who had similar critiques to Super Studio, and created fictional plans of vast, department store-like underground spaces. They painted an image and a vision of a world that we could be headed toward if we don't change the way we live and the way that we design our architecture. And of course, we have Archigram, who made comics of technological dreams where entire cities could drop down from the sky, or ones that could walk the earth searching for resources. They used comics to project possible futures, to dropkick us into thinking about the possibilities of the future. All these examples are architects that make comics, but that's only one direction that this can take. And the show that's here in Chicago collects comics that were all born here in this city and constructs an exhibition of sequenced rooms to collect them and to order them. I sat down with the designer of the show, Thomas Kelly, from the practice Norman Kelly, to talk a little bit about the crossovers between world making in architecture and in comics and how this comes out in the show. How can you convey in a three-dimensional world the flatness of the comic cell, but then the, the depth that one is given uh, once you kind of enter in within that cell? And one of the first keys to bridging between the world of architecture and comics have to do with scale and size. The design of a physical spatial exhibition for comics requires a kind of translation between the scale of the city that one just came from, the scale of the building that it's housed inside, and the rooms that the comics are housed in, with the physical medium of the small comic book and the page itself. Our strategy was to approach uh, the existing space first and find a way to scale it down so uh, someone might be able to actually read uh, a comic uh, or an excerpt from a comic that the curator was trying to put forth. Um, and so what we tried to do was design uh, rooms or small cells um, through a, an enfilade format where essentially you're creating rooms that open up onto other rooms. So they're both uh, distinct but connected. To introduce visitors to this world, the curator chose to feature murals by the artist Edie Fake for a variety of reasons. I've been a huge fan of Edie's work for a couple of years now, but I never really thought about it in relationship to comics. But this kind of abstract world can serve as a setup for entering into a new physical world, and it can prime you to dive into the drawn stories of the comics. But with Edie's work, um, because uh, at least the work that was selected or the kind of work that was selected kind of operates at the scale of the architectural elevation. It seemed really natural that Edie's work could get scaled up to introduce you to a world. It also allowed us to highlight the, I guess the, the dominant proportion in the show, which is an 11 foot by 11 foot square, um, which it is the dominant structural uh, unit uh, in the building. It generates a lot of the openings in the buildings for sliding doors. Um, it is kind of the, the gap between columns within the building. Edie's pieces also introduce you to the colors of the exhibition. And color can be a really powerful tool of world making. Think about the green hue of the Matrix movies, for instance. Colorful depictions can also help draw you into projecting yourself into the world that's being depicted, or for structuring the world around you. We worked with uh, Corbusier's uh, palette of 64 colors um, from his uh, uh, you know, very well-known architectural uh, polychromy uh, essay. That at least gave us a, a, a finite palette uh, in some cases to present uh, some options to some of these artists, like what color would work best with your work. But then it also allowed us behind the scenes to sequence the show in a way where 
color would also navigate the time periods and also the um, the really kind of rigorous uh, symmetry of the, the existing building. So when you look east, um, all of the walls are painted in a more saturated uh, kind of high contrast color. Um, and then when you look west, oftentimes within the same uh, uh, room, uh, you'll see that same color, but kind of shown in a more uh, uh, desaturated, less high contrast way. World building allows a number of different activities to come together, more than just comics and architecture. And so I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on world building down in the discussion section below. You know, maybe we can really grow a dialogue down there. And if you've enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. All of these kinds of engagements, they really help to get this content out there. Also, please consider subscribing if you haven't already and check out some of my other videos on the channel that you might also find interesting. See you guys over there.